I'd like to call this meeting to order of the State Board of Education for Tuesday, September 13th, 2022. And welcome you all, those attending in person and online with us this afternoon. We're going to start by asking Dr. Stapleton to lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First up is approval of our State Board of Education minutes for August 9th of 2022, and then also our special called meeting last week on September 7th. Is there any objection to approving the minutes as presented? Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, a very minor matter, and I forgive me, on the August 9th meeting, I was present online. I wasn't sure if I was connecting or not. I wasn't here, but I tried to participate, and I was online. I don't know if that's the same as being absent, but the, the minutes show that I was absent that day and I was online and I'm not sure if I ever came. We will make that correction. We certainly that, want to show that you were participating. Yes, you're, thank you, Chairman. All right. With that exception, anything else? All right. Next item is the approval of the agenda for today's meeting. Is there any objection to approving the agenda as presented? Hearing none, the agenda is approved by unanimous consent. We do have some visitors with us here today, and we want to recognize mm -hmm. them. We have, looks like, Jenna Hallman from Sarah. B. McKenzie, is it Appling? From SCSHA. Cody Kriegsman from the SCEA. Patrick Kelly from the PSTA. And Nicole Davis from the SCEA. Did I miss anybody else visiting with us today? Thank you all for being with us. And we did not have anybody sign up for the media list, and we had nobody sign up for public comments today. So the only thing I want to put in my report to you today is something I'm sure we've all heard of by now, and certainly it was sad news, and that was the loss of Dr. Rose Wilder. Uh, certainly she was a legendary educator in South Carolina. Most recently she was serving as superintendent in Williamsburg County, and uh, I think really she was working right up in that last week. It was just really incredible. That was her level of dedication to education. So I'd just like to ask that we take a moment of silence and remember her contributions and offer up uh, prayers for those affected by her loss. Thank you. And Superintendent Spearman is not here today. Do we have anything that's being relayed on her behalf for us today, Madam Parliamentarian? Molly is not here. Uh, Superintendent Spearman is not here today because she is having a, her portrait revealed, or um, I think it is revealed, at uh, SCAZA. It's being presented today at SCAZA. So she is, um, hope to get a picture of the picture. Um, and, uh, and she did not. She did not have a report for today beyond um, where, what her location is. I did want to just take a moment to, and I definitely appreciate uh, Mr. Walter's um, moment of silence for Dr. Rose Wilder. I worked closely with her in Williamsburg, and um, she was an amazing woman, and I, I, I can't say enough about her. And I want, uh, if Mr. Brennan, he might have been the only one that would have been here in 2018, she came only once to be with y'all because her work was in Williamsburg County. Um, so she, she seldom left the district. Uh, she was working. Uh, Dr. Wims called her the day before she passed away to talk about a school matter that she gave advice on. And the district is devastated. Um, and we're just working with them just to keep it going. Uh, not, not to, they're doing a great job. But she was a force, a force to be reckoned with and, um, and the best possible way. 
So I just wanted to have that moment. Thank you. And as we previously said, there was nobody signed up for public comments, so we can move directly to our state board items. The Policy and Legislative Committee did not meet this month, uh, nor did the Educator Professions Committee. However, the Standards Learning and Accountability Committee did meet, and I'd like to recognize Ms. Frierson to give that report. Thank you. Um, the um, SLA committee met, um, and Dr. David Mathis, um, Deputy Superintendent of Divisions, College, and Careers, uh, presented to us um, that the State Board of Education has the responsibility of appointing with the recommendation of the State Superintendent of Education an advisory committee for the instructional materials adoption process uh, submitted for state approval, South Carolina Board of Education approval, uh, are the recommendations to fill vacancies on the instructional materials advisory committee. We had a list. And that was placed on the consent agenda, is that correct? Yes, sir, that was placed on the consent agenda. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And Ms. Chapman, all that time from the other committees not meeting was put to great use by your committee this morning. I know you've got to definitely have a report for us. Yes, sir. We acted on 23 cases this morning in subcommittee, 21 suspensions, and two public reprimands. So that was 23 cases total that were dealt with this morning. And uh, those cases were also ratified in the full board educator licensure committee meeting, which was held just after that. Uh, the full board also had one case that came before it today. That was a teacher license case where the recommendation of a hearing officer was for a three-month suspension, and the board, the board voted to go with that recommendation. So that was a total of 24 cases that got dealt with today in those committees. Our next item up is the consent agenda. Uh, You've had it distributed to you, and you've just heard Ms. Frierson tell you what the item was for it today. That was the only item, I believe, that was on there. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, no. And the consent agenda is approved. So now we can go into our... State Board of Education reports. We have no items for approval this month, but we do have a number of information items. And the first one is about our board budget. So, Ms. Williams, you're not going to say we spent too much money, are you? I will not. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, other members of the board. I'm going to briefly go over um, your state board budget. It's not a quarter quarter ending, so we're a little early, um, but I stand before you to go over your budget as of August 31st, um, 2022. Um, so for fiscal year 2023, you have a budget um, that's reflected on this first handout. Um, under the current budget column, you'll see a budget of $258,034, um, and that amount is um, broken down into two components. So one for state board operations and the other related to educator cases, which you'll see toward the bottom of the, the spreadsheet. The operations component of the budget is budgeted at $226,034 and that educator cases portion is budgeted at $32,000. Um, so included in that $226,000 is um, a personnel component, which is budgeted at $182,000. Um, of which $151,061 remains. Um, so that is right on target. Um, $12,000 is budgeted to cover the cost of per diem. And then come down middle of the page, you'll see $32,034 is budgeted for other operating expenditures to cover um, items like meals, lodging, um, mileage reimbursements, and video conferencing. So as of August 31st, you'll see that in that year-to-date actual expenditure column, which is sort of a little over from middle of the page, you'll see that you've expended $420.01 to date um, for web conferencing services. 
so after considering a purchase order kind of established for future web conferencing services, there's about $28,827 remaining. Um, and toward the bottom of the page, as it relates to the educator services or the educator cost portion, you've expended $593.10 to date, um, leaving a balance of $15,847 after we consider those purchase orders. Um, now, the second handout you have, that provides the, um, the de more of the details on the year-to-date expenditures. Um, as always, Mr. Chair, we'll continue to monitor the expenditures to make sure we have things loaded in the correct portion, in the correct components of your budget, um, and so that we can ensure that they're utilized for the intended purposes. Um, and I'm available if there are any questions. Thank you for keeping us in line. Any questions? And I'll try to make it a little bigger next time because I'm struggling <laughs> to see these numbers. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our next item is our literacy update with Dr. Mathis. And we have handouts. We do, we do. And there's going to be a test at the end, so just <laughs> get prepared. Um, <clears throat> I did want to uh, share with you today, it's a, it's a little bit more than a literacy update, and to take the opportunity to talk to you really more broadly about um, college and career readiness and where we are in, in um, our division. Um, the, the South Carolina Department of Education, as you know, is, is fortunate to have uh, a talented uh, uh, directors at, in the agency and th those folks are leading our offices. Um, our directors um, make the job of deputies very easy because our directors are resident experts um, in their subject area or the offices they are leading and they're recognized um, by our school and district um, officials as um, people that are, are quality and are experts at, at what they do. Um, clearly, they're masterful um, in their work and, and building capacity and helping districts. Um, just a couple of changes in directors at the agency that I want to mention to you. Um, earlier this summer, um, Dr. Quincy Moore, who came, originally came to the department as the Director of Early Learning and Literacy, um, with a little um, encouragement and twisting on my end, I encouraged her um, and asked her to move over to become the Director of the Career CTE, Career and Technical Education. Um, as you know, Dr. Moore is a former uh, district superintendent, former high school principal, and opened a career center um, in her district or built one in for her, for her um, uh, district and, and partnered with um, the, the university there to make, that, to make that happen. So she was clearly a natural for that, for that position. So I feel like she's now in her wheelhouse and is going to really do some, some good work there. Um, but it is... Uh, it is very important that today I recognize um, the new director of Early Learning and Literacy and is Dr. Abby Duggins. Dad, Abby, would you stand up and let them see who you are? Um, we're very proud that she's here. She arrived Tuesday after Labor Day. And so, as you well know, the, the Office of Early Learning and Literacy is a key, key position because of the foundation that those early learners need to have. Abby was most recently the direct, the assistant superintendent of instruction in um, Saluda County Schools. Prior to that, she was assistant principal at Saluda High School, where she was named the 2017 assistant principal of the year. So, again, quality, capacity, just bring on good people, right, to make the job a whole lot easier. So, but the most important thing right now, I think, about <coughs> Abby coming to the department was she most recently has chaired and facilitated um, the revision of our English language art standards that will be presented to you in, in November. So having said that, a um, couple of things that, thank you. I have Vanna White here helping me um, today. <laughs> uh, as you know, last week, our South Carolina Ready scores were released as far as, as South Carolina passed. But <clears throat> um, I want to talk to you just a few minutes about the, uh, the test scores, and those are being passed out to you. Um, and then some of the resources that we're going to make available to our, our 
schools and our classroom teachers um, to help um, as we move forward. So I'll give a second while those are being handed out. Um, So looking at the, 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 the charts with the test scores, ELA and math, and you've got, if you look first at ELA, on the front, flip front side you've got um, grades three through five, and on the back of the each you have grades six through eight. You see the, the uh, categories of, our, of how our um, test scores are returned to our students. They're either in scores and does not meet, approaching expectations, meets expectations, exceeds expectations, and then we also, um, for our purposes, make sure we um, are looking at those students who are meeting and exceeding the expectations. Because that's our goal for all students, is to get to that level of meeting or exceeding expectations. Um, I'm glad the psychometricians aren't here because they would tell me what I'm telling you is a little voodoo, but it's the best way that I can explain it. So if you're looking at does not meet, um, does not meet expectations, you're talking about students who are scoring below grade level. And oftentimes those students, depending on where they are in that, um, that category, could be as many as two years behind, two or more years behind. That's sort of how we, we couch that. And then you have a, approaching expectations. But as you move over in approaching expectations, you halfway over, you could still, a student scoring there could still be a grade level below. And so keeping in mind, our goal is for all students to make yearly growth. They should grow from where they are, um, make a year's worth of growth. But for those who are behind in approaching or does not meet, we need them to make that yearly growth plus um, what we call that catch-up growth. And if you look at the scores, you, I, I will tell you, I think our teachers have done a great job this year, considering the circumstances of the pandemic. If you look down, uh, uh, these are the state averages, grades uh, of all our grades, grades three through eight are what we test on SC Ready. You will see in ELA that there was improvement in all the categories and all the areas from, from the previous year. Um, it's, we would say that we have returned, when we look at this, we, at the spring of 2022, we've returned to pre-pandemic. Now, even when we say we've returned, there's still a lot of work to do. We're not where we want to be, but we have really um, returned to that, to that level. There's more work to do and there's more resources and there's more things we need to offer our teachers with the uh, new ELA standards that are coming out, I think that's really gonna help. Because when you stop and you think about these test scores, what that equates to are the number of standards a teacher teaches. And if you look at our ELA standards, the current ones we have, um, in some grades, there's more than 100. And so with the new standards, there has been a focus on um, reducing the number, but also really focusing on, in those early grades, prior to grade three, the foundations of literacy. And if we can get that foundation right, then we can build from that. So I think we're poised to really see some growth as, as we go forward and as we build capacity in our teachers um, with around these new standards. If you look at math, um, the, on the second sheet there, um, while there was improvement from 21 to 22, um, I think it's, it, we would not say that we're back to pre-pandemic. We still have more work to do in that area. So what's the difference, I'm often asked, for ELA and math, why math? Well, nationwide, um, the, the projections in math trended the same, that not as, as well as ELA. Um, in talking to teachers and, and just getting practical experience, and that's some places where you get your best information, um, during the pandemic, if you think about this, some, our students, in the, especially those primary grades, lower grades, when it comes to math, missed some key concepts because they were, they were out because of the pandemic. If you think about 
a fourth grader last year in 2022. If you count back in 23, I mean, in, in the year before 21, he was in third grade. And that was a hybrid year. That was, were you in school face-to-face? -face? Were you um, hybrid in school two days, three days a week? Or were you virtual? So that was a very disruptive year. The year before when they were in second grade was the year that all things stopped in March. But in second grade, there were some key concepts like place value. If you didn't get place value in second grade, by the time you got to fourth grade and were expected to, to take that uh, administration of SC Ready, teachers had to go back and teach those skills. And I had a teacher um, in my neighborhood that said, I, I need to tell you something. She said, I'm going back to get those skills that they, they missed in second grade, like place value. She said, but the pressure right here is great because I've got a test. I still, I've got standards in fourth grade. And so I said, well, it sort of feels like you're changing the tire on the car, but the car's still moving, right? She said, yes, because I'm trying to go back and catch up this work. But as we move forward there, I've still got these standards at this grade level. And so enormous amount of pressure um, on our teachers. But I, I do want to recognize that while the scores aren't where we really want them to be, and we do have more work to do, I would say that um, we really need to celebrate with our teachers um, that we did not decline. Because if you think about last year, um, when we were expecting a normal year, um, what was it, almost a half a million of quarantines through the year of students and faculty, and you're talking about some students out at the beginning of the year multiple times because of, of quarantines. And if you're not there, it's very difficult. So um, those are our, our, our assessment results for SC Ready, just to show you where they are, but if you can just take some time and look at those and see um, between the, the two years the, the improvement, but yet the work that we need to still accomplish. Um, just so you know that the, the end of course examination program, so the end of course exams in Algebra One, English, Biology, U.S. History, those results will be released um, to the public on September 19th. So we're, we're preparing for those that release. And then the report cards, um, school and district report cards with the ratings will be released on October 13th. So a couple more releases as they come out. So you stop and think about it. Well, here are the scores. So what are we doing? How are we helping um, districts and teachers through this? There are a couple of resources that I just want to mention to you that we are really focusing on. And if you look at, at those scores, especially uh, in math, the state used part of our ESSER money to address learning loss. Every school district in the state has access to, um, especially in math, math resources around um, in the primary grades, it's Dreambox Learning. It is a program that um, has shown great results and it takes a student where they are um, it is digital. They can, they can do it from home. They can access it from home. They can access it um, in class, um, wherever they are, on vacation, during the summer, wherever they have access to that. As the student works through the program, it, not, it, it, it adjusts to their ability level, not based on right or wrong answer, but based on how they think mathematically and where they need, then need help and instruction. So for those students who 15 minutes a day, uh, we are seeing great results from them that are, because those are the ones that are going back and teachers are saying, well, he missed place value. That's what he needs. I can go back now and, and, and get that reinforcement. Grades 6 through 12 in math, we have access, all districts have access to what we call Math Nation. Um, it used to be Algebra Nation, but it's expanded into all areas of math. And students can, with this, have a, um, they can sign on and get um, additional help and support for some quality math teachers. Um, and oftentimes, um, 
teachers use this different ways. Some will assign, that use Math Nation, they will assign their students um, to go on to Math Nation prior to the lesson just to get some schema and feedback so they'll have um, background knowledge before they start the unit or they may use it um, as reinforcement. I saw this used in a, a ninth grade algebra class. And I'll tell you what happened. Um, as, as I talked to the, the students in the class, the ones that appealed to the most were the ninth grade boys. Because they said, I asked them, I said, so tell me why you like this. And they said, well, sometimes we're, we don't want to ask questions out in class. You know, we don't want to be, we don't want to act like we don't know. And so we go home and do algebra nation, get all, you know, get our help. And so when we come back to class, you know, we can be very proud that we um, have some background in schema. I think it was, one, you know, more or less wanting to show off in front of their female counterparts, but um, nonetheless, it worked. Um, there again, with when it's used with fidelity. Um, also, our districts all have access to what we call the rally tool. You'll hear a lot in the future about um, our growth targets and how those are changing with um, the new accountability or the accountability system. And as uh, of this year, our students, as they make their annual growth, will actually have a growth target to reach. In the past, it's been somewhat of guesswork. So now um, each student will know how many points they have to grow to get to their target, which is good, but it's also for those students who are in those does not meet categories, it's going to be a lift. It's going to, but teachers will now know how far they need to grow. I think that the importance of what will happen now is um, the interim benchmark assessments we use are going to be critical. We give those three times a year. How's a teacher going to know if that student is reaching that growth target? They're going to have to rely on the resources that we've provided. Math Nation Dreambox Learning will, will show progression, but those interim benchmark assessments will show growth toward that target as well. The key thing then is to work with our teachers to help them understand um, the data that they, they have before them. Um, that is one of our focus points is, um, and the folks at the department get me tired of saying this, but I always say all God's children got data walls and data notebooks. We're putting data in notebooks, but do we really understand it? And so helping teachers and school leaders understand what the data means and how then to move forward is, has got to be a priority for what we do. And so that's going to be one of our priorities. The other is, um, you've heard us talk about the Instruction Hub or the Learning Object Repository. There are things that we've purchased that go in there. Um, Al Algebra Nation is in there. Um, um, Discovery Education is in there. There are other resources that have been purchased that, di that districts can use. But this year, what we feel is, is important is teachers and educators really won't use it until those lesson plans are in there. So you've got a folder um, at your place. And I just wanted to give you an example. You can keep it if you want to. If you don't want to keep it, please give it back because I'm going to give these to teachers. But when they access the, the repository, and one of the lessons in second grade is math, um, um, excuse me, is, uh, is math fluency and extending that from first grade. Think about it, uh, knowing that fl having that fluency in math, just like in reading, is extremely important. On the left side, you will see a unit plan. Um, I know you don't want to read through all of that, but this plan is for the unit. The teacher can take this unit on math fluency. It's divided out into days. Um, and what is done each day. They can take this lesson that you can see is aligned to the standards. Um, they can use it as is. Um, we have vetted it that it is a quality lesson. Um, they then can, or they can make changes to that lesson if they need to. But we've built it around the key components of good sound teaching. And that is having aligned to the standards. What are the objectives of the lesson? 
You can see the essential questions that the teacher is trying to help students understand in that lesson, how the lesson is sequenced, and then the materials that are um, involved um, and that are needed. And then we don't want them to go look for the materials. They're here. So at the back of this um, unit and then on the you see on the, on the right side of your pocket folder are the resources that they need. So it's that one-stop shop where they go to get that lesson. So there are, there are several key components that are important in these lessons. And if, you were, if you're an educator back in the day, you remember PET, Performance of Effective Teaching? It was just good teaching, right? Well, these lesson plans are built off of that. Accessing prior knowledge. Um, making sure that the, the purpose of the lesson is stated. And then that strong tier one instructional support. So this is just a, an example of one lesson. We have now built these out for um, grades K to two in ELA uh, and math. Um, we have a few more to, to, to have out there, but um, <clears throat> within the next few weeks, teachers will have access um, to these lessons. I think it's also good for new teachers beginning to teachers to see a good exemplar. Um, you know, when you're starting out, um, you want to make sure you're doing the best job you can. And you, you wonder, you, you don't want that principal coming in your room and observing you all the time but you want some feedback if it's a good lesson. Here is an exemplar where a, a teacher can go and see, it's got all the key component, it's got all the um, parts of that lesson, and then if the school administration helps with the, the implementation, implementing it with fidelity, and I often say, when done well, it's great to have this, but implement it well, go deep, the idea here is that we don't skim the surface, that we take the time and, and go deep. So just an example, but we're very proud of what um, some of our teachers are putting together for us. And um, hopefully what we really want to do is build that clearinghouse of lessons in South Carolina that teachers can go and pull some of the best lessons. And so then they don't have to Google and pull things that really don't up um, aren't as applicable to that lesson. So we, um, those, re those resources are out there and we feel like that's going to be a strong component um, place for our teachers. We want to save them time. We want them to go to one place, a one-stop shop, get, have the lessons, have the resources. But the key to it is then good, strong, professional dialogue in their school with their colleagues um, about these lessons. We believe that's some of the best professional development they can get. Another resource that we're trying to get out there <clears throat> is we've partnered with the State Library, you've heard me say this before, on tutor.com. It is a free tutoring uh, resource. Um, we're, we're working hard even more so to get the word out there to our schools and um, we, we got the first usage report. Um, the, the highest month, um, I think you can imagine why, was February of the usage. By that point, they realized halfway through, it may need some help. Um, the two subject areas, number one area that um, was used on tutor.com was math, um, followed by science, and high school math was the, the, top, um, uh, the top numbers for, for this. But it goes down to kindergarten. If a parent wanted to go on with their child and get help 24 hours a day, seven days a week with quality tutors. Um, I noticed that the um, feedback from the, the parents and those involved was a 98% satisfaction rate. So they're, they're good. <coughs> the, those tutors are, are, are vetted and they're high quality. So that's a resource that <laughs> We can't get out there enough. It is free and it is quality. Um, so making sure that any time you have to relay that would be great.
The last thing that I want to mention to you is something to follow up with your last, your call board meeting this last week was the financial literacy and the next steps um, that we're going to take for that. So as you know, the let you you approved on first reading regulations around the new requirement for students to earn a half a unit of credit of financial literacy, which will really begin with the class of um, freshman class of 23 entering high school in 23. So by the time they graduate in 27, they will need to have earned a half a unit in financial literacy. We did not want to add another unit, you know, the graduation requirements. So there's still 24 units. There were seven units that could be used as or electives, and so we are saying that a half of one of those would be um, for financial literacy, so the other six and a half could be used um, as electives. When you're trying to schedule a half a unit in a high school, that's not always easy. So we want multiple pathways for them to, to earn that credit. So we do know there it can be done in, in career and technology through the business program. But also, um, we're developing a pathway outside of CTE to offer that, that half a unit. Um, we're in conversations right now with the state of Virginia who have done this since 2009. And so we're going to learn, learn lessons from them. They, um, you know, Molly Spearman is the chair of the CCSSO. CCSSO says that Virginia has some of the, the best financial literacy standards. Everyone has embraced. Um, teachers, um, administrators have embraced the need for this, but we've got to implement it well and we've got to break down the barriers so that it's not a burden to implement um, in schools. So the next step will be to identify some key stakeholders who need to be involved in this process. And so we do know the Bankers Association, Junior Achievement, Department of Insurance, um, Department of Commerce, uh, Key folks need to be at the table as we develop those standards, along with um, teachers, along with administrators, as we develop the financial literacy standards. Then we will um, look for resources and materials to align to those standards, to make those available to, to um, our districts. At the same time, we'll be identifying the certification areas that a teacher would need to have to teach, teach financial literacy. So we know that um, the, the, some of our economics teachers and they're certified in social studies, have the capacity in the background. So that's an area we'll look, business, possibly math, some other areas that a teacher would have the, um, the, the background to be able to teach financial literacy. Then we want to offer districts how to put all that together as a course and how you offer that um, that course to your students. And then last but not least is to provide the professional learning um, for the teachers that will teach financial literacy. And um, this will be run out of, or this will be facilitated by um, Dr. Moore out of our career in technology because of the stakeholders that need to be at the table while we do this. We feel like that's the, the right place to do it. The other day, uh, and I'll just end with this. A news reporter asked me, he said, he was walking, he was very interested, and he's a young guy, and he was 22, and he was talking about how, how he's trying to make his first, you know, his car payments and, and, and have, uh, uh, have a place to live and afford all of that. And I said, well, then you can understand the importance of financial literacy. He said, yes. He said, would, would it have benefited you to have, have had financial literacy um, when you were in high school? And I said, it certainly would, would have. And I said, I'll just tell you this. Um, I remember my mother called me when I was in college, and she said the bank statement came. And just because there are checks in the checkbook does not mean there's money in the bank. <laughs> she said, you're going to run out of money before the end of the month. So sometimes those lessons you learn are pretty hard, and they're hard to overcome, and that's what we want to avoid with our students so that they don't um, fall into those pitfalls because once you accumulate debt, it's very hard to overcome. So that is, that is some of the most important work that we're gonna do going forward, um, but just wanted to share just an update with you. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. Mr. Krowski. Well, thank you very much for, <clears throat> as always, a very detailed and great effort. 
an organization. Now that I have grandchildren about this age and I see them, I just wanted to ask you what this meant in the, I was reading the first second grade math, students are exposed to multiple opportunities to demonstrate fluency through model strategies by providing flexibility for individual thinking and understanding. And then it, this unit begins with fact fluency development followed by concrete exploration. I wasn't sure what that meant. Is so, that like a holistic approach to math no, as opposed it's, it's, to memorization um, and drill and, and skill? The math people may explain it a little bit better than I would, but when it comes to the math fluency, we want them to know that five plus five is 10. Right. Not that I've got to count fingers and that kind of thing to get to it. So it's that independent thinking that, you know, that you're fluent with those skills and you know in those math facts um, as you think through that. Individual um, abilities, and that doesn't mean there's different answers to the no. same thing. And No, sir. And five plus five is 10. Talk so. about very eloquently the financial literacy and how that prepares you for life and what we do in school prepares us to be better citizens. But wouldn't that also be a, a grounds for like always having conduct and effort graded too? Because that's what makes you do well in life and everything else. Wouldn't that be an equal thing to explore for the department to have some kind of a, your effort and conduct graded every year in every class, as opposed to making you a better citizen and molding better products? Well, Mr. Kabarski, I don't know that a, a, actually a, a conduct grade is is um, is where where we would we, I don't know assigning a grade if that would because it's so subjective. Um, we did that back when I was in school, but I think one of the most important things we can do is teach our students by examples um, how to be good citizens and how to to respond to each other. Um, and what it means to be a good citizen and as we as we move through school and that's a hard thing to do to put a to measure it and put a, a grade or a uh, well, I meant in terms of giving a teacher ability to um, somehow signify the effort a student's making or not because that often is you only get out of it the proportion to the effort you put into it right yeah I, I I would I would hesitate to give conduct grades, but um, I would, um, as an elementary and a middle school principal, my focus was how we teach our students to just be those good model citizens, and we need to model that for, for our students and reward those students when you see that. Other questions? I've got one. I'm going to go back to financial literacy for a minute because this question was posed to me last week. I think you've answered it, but I want to make sure I could repeat that answer to them when it comes up again. So uh, I think from what you said, that as far as who will be able to teach the course, that's going to be determined, but economics, business, social studies, perhaps, and that there would be a professional learning requirement as opposed to certification. Yes, there would not be a separate certification for that, but we do know there's teachers who are certified in something, certain areas right now that would have, you know, the background to teach that. But the important thing is to give them the um, professional development, professional training to be able to teach that. That's why the standards are important, so that they can be trained with those and any coursework that we and materials that we could have to share with them while we while we train. And I think that was the concern It was addressed to me. It was just that there was a perception maybe you're just going to say to, okay, this teacher, this teacher, you're now the financial literacy instructor. No. So, yeah. yeah. Very good. Any other questions? All right. Thank, thank you, you, sir. And now, Ms. Mack, your reports are getting shorter and shorter. <laughs> you're down to two districts. Good afternoon, everyone. Always love being the last one at the party. Um, I'm going to give you some brief updates on Allendale and Williamsburg. On Saturday, August 13th, several businesses and community partners hosted an Allendale Fairfax school supply event. The Chandler Law Firm, Tracy's Snack Shack, 
State Farm Agent B.J. Jordan and the Knee Bruisers Motorcycle Club provided free school supplies and bag lunches to Allendale County School Districts. I know y'all are all like, knee bruisers, I'll have <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to leave that alone. Um, on August 22nd, Allendale County School District and the Allendale County School Board hosted a joint school board and community meeting. And file diagnostic assessments were administered August 16th through August 23rd for Allendale Fairfax Elementary and Middle Schools, as well as ninth graders at Allendale Fairfax High School. In Williamsburg County School District, you did allude to um, Dr. Rose Wilder um, passing away. She passed on the 30th of August. Um, the district and the community are mourning her loss, but they're celebrating her impact that she had during her tenure. Dr. Kelvin Wims, who was a former transformation coach for the South Carolina Department of Ed, is serving as the interim superintendent. Um, King Street Senior High School has entered into a dual enrollment agreement with Williamsburg Technical College. And if you know anything about that campus, Williamsburg is right next door to the high school. And so this is their first real um, partnership with Williamsburg Tech. Um, additionally, the district will be, be begin working with South Carolina Governor's School Accelerate and Early College Virtual Program. And at the August school board meeting, each Williamsburg County School District principal presented updates to the board and community regarding their schools. This concludes my report. Any questions for Ms. Mack? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. What, yes, ma what, what, what um, did you just say the King Street Senior High was the only one that's going to be? Well, right now, yes. Um, and, you know, C.E. Murray... I know they combined. Combined. Okay, what about I, Hemingway? I believe Hemingway students have an opportunity to be involved, but the partnership, because of how close it is, because the students would need to be able to go to Williamsburg um, Technical College for the courses. So I'm not saying Hemingway students are excluded, right. but this started initially with King Street High. Thank yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you. that. Any other questions? Thank you very Thank much. Thank you all. All right, I don't know of any other business that's on the agenda. As always, I have to remind you about your travel forms. If you haven't already turned them in, please do so. Uh, I'm gonna get this on your radar now. Of course, we'll meet at our regular time in October, but our November meeting falls on election day. And though while schools are closed, this building isn't closed. And so we're all invited to be here that day. So that's <laughs> November the 8th. So be sure and vote early before you come uh, for that November meeting. And with that, with no other business to be held, this meeting will be adjourned.